Okay. Well, hello and welcome to our fifth talk in the 2020 NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of these seminars is to showcase NOAA's leadership in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. First, I want to acknowledge my partners who work to make this seminar series happen. Hernan Garcia of the NESDIS National Center for, of Environmental Information, or NCEI, Sandra Clare from the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation, Katie Rowley, our webinar host today from NOAA OAR's NOAA Central Library, and I am Tracy Gill with the NOS National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Before we start, here are a few seminar logistics. Please type your questions and comments into the Q&A chat box at any time, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the seminar. If you have a technical issue, try logging off and then back on. You can also type any technical issues into the chat box and Katie Rowley will address them. We are also recording this seminar. The recording and PDF of the slides will be made available in a few days at a link to be included in the chat box. A follow-up email will also be sent. So today's seminar is titled Creating One NOAA by Ms. Louisa Koch. Louisa Koch is NOAA's Director of Education and the National Team Lead for the Regional Collaboration. Louisa and her team educate and inspire the public and future workforce about the Earth system, working with NOAA's amazing array of people, partners, places, and information. Louisa served at NOAA's acting as Ac NOAA's acting deputy undersecretary and deputy assistant administrator for research. Before joining NOAA, Louisa worked for the Office of Management and Budget, the Department of Defense, and the Joint Economic Committee for the U.S. Congress. Louisa earned a master's in electrical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a bachelor's in physics from Middlebury College. M Louisa lives in Maryland with her husband and two daughters. Take it away, Louisa. Okay, thanks very much, Tracy. And thanks, Hernan and Katie Rally, for uh, getting this all set up. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. You guys are doing an amazing job with the One NOAA Seminar Series. Congratulations on having hit 7,000 members on the subscriber list. That's pretty amazing. Um, so this is a great example of a One NOAA effort, and that's what I'm going to be talking about with you today. Bringing together offering, offerings and audiences from across NOAA to provide a rich learning environment is exactly the kind of thing One NOAA is all about. It is my pleasure to be here to talk with you today to give you a little bit of history and a little bit of current application about One NOAA. I am the Director of Education and also the National Team Lead for the Regional Collaboration Network. In both of these roles, I work to bring the pieces of NOAA together to make a greater whole. Before I came to NOAA, I worked for OMB and on Capitol Hill, and these experiences made me realize how important it is for NOAA to be strong and focused so we can garner the support we need to do all the important things we want to do. They made me very committed to the One NOAA effort. So let's explore this. Uh, and my slides are not advancing. Do I have control, Katie, of the slides? You do. Okay, I... there you go. Okay. Um, John Byrne was the third administrator of NOAA, and he served back in the 1980s. He found that the NOAA programs were not well connected, and he said, NOAA only exists in the mind of the administrator. It isn't surprising that the pieces of NOAA weren't well connected. NOAA had only existed for about 10 years, and it was made up of a lot of organizations with very disparate and focused missions. Many of these organizations had proud histories going back a long time. NOAA was created 50 years ago. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary this very year, but NOAA's foundation goes back to over 200 years. The Survey of the Coast, the predecessor of today's Office of Coast Survey in the National Ocean Service, was established in 1807. It is the oldest civilian science agency in the United States. 63 years later, in 1870, the National Weather Warning Service was established. They are too celebrating their 50th anniversary. This organization, no, not the 50th, the 150th, this organization would eventually become the National Weather Service. A year later, in 1871, the U.S. Commission of Fish and Fisheries, the precursor to NOAA Fisheries, was authorized. This was the first conservation agency in the United States. Over the next 100 years, other parts of NOAA, other parts of what is now NOAA were created. And each of these organizations had important missions and major challenges to address. 
Each of these organizations had strong identities, highly skilled in professionals, and attentive constituents. In 1970, when NOAA was formed, these organizations were brought together into one organization that didn't really connect them. So it is not surprising that 10 years after NOAA was established, the NOAA administrator felt that he was the only connection between the different parts of the agency. When we look at NOAA today, each line office has its own mission, its own budget, its own culture, and its own network of offices, labs, and or programs. The coherence within the line offices is very important to the effective functioning of NOAA. The Weather Service needs to have consistent approaches to weather forecasting across the country. The Fishery Service needs to have a consistent regulatory structure and needs to apply common approaches from one fishery to the next. Within line offices, there are programs with strong identities, like the National Marine Sanctuary Program and the National Sea Grant Program. These programs have their own mission, budget, culture, and network of component parts. NOAA is a complex network of networks, and NOAA's budget helps drive the independence of the lines and programs. NOAA funding is appropriated directly to the lines and programs. In many cases, the program and office directors have more authority over funds than the NOAA or line office leadership. This makes it hard to dedicate funding to NOAA-wide efforts. Agency investments are often seen as, com as coming at the expense of line and program mission. This tension creates divisiveness within NOAA, where operating units can see themselves as competing against each other and sometimes against NOAA itself. Many lines and programs have logos that represent their unique contribution. The widespread use of these subsidiary logos within, without the NOAA logo communicates the importance of the individual parts rather than the strength of the integrated NOAA whole. I have helped make more than one program lo logo during my time at NOAA, but I can't see making another one. Even when we present the NOAA logo by itself, we do so inconsistent inconsistently which reduces its impact. When Admiral Lautenbacher joined NOAA in 2001, he conducted a bottoms-up review. He asked everyone in NOAA to offer ideas about how we could work better as an agency. One of the themes in the responses was that NOAA was too stovepiped. People saw the benefits of working together across the line offices to address the complex and multifaceted problems confronting NOAA but it was very difficult to do. There were lots of cultural barriers. This was 2001 and concern about climate change was increasing and it was impacting every part of NOAA. There was valuable expertise spread across the agency. NOAA research was working to understand the short and long-term impacts of climate change. The National Weather Service was starting to issue climate forecasts. Fisheries and the Ocean Service were seeing major impacts of climate change on ecosystems. The climate efforts across the line offices had common drivers and interconnecting issues. Issues like ocean acidification, drought, and harmful algal blooms offered similar cross-cutting challenges and opportunities. To make it easier to work across NOAA and to create a more coherent agency structure, Admiral Lautenbacher started creating new capabilities to better connect NOAA. As part of that effort, people started talking about one NOAA. People created One NOAA bracelets and One NOAA seminars. The Bottoms Up Review also focused on resources in NOAA. There were many efforts in NOAA that didn't have enough money to accomplish what was needed, and there still are. NOAA gets its money from Congress. There are 535 members of Congress. Most members of Congress really care about something NOAA does, but no two members feel the same way. For NOAA to get more money, we need support from a lot of members at the same time. When a whole bunch of NOAA programs go to Capitol Hill separately and advocate for their own issues without telling a bigger NOAA story, it is hard for them to get enough support to increase the NOAA appropriation. NOAA has a reputation of being split and divided rather than uniting to fight for the greater whole. Appropriation staff complained that advocates for NOAA programs would ask for increases for funding for things they cared about and suggest those increases be paid for by cuts to other parts of NOAA. The One NOAA effort was advocating for support for NOAA as a whole. As we started to think about One NOAA, we became more aware of how divided we were. 
One of the people helping unite NOAA was a senior leader from fisheries. At an SES summit, he stood up in front of all of NOAA's executives and told this story. He was traveling across the country and he was wearing his NOAA pin and he got on the plane and he passed by the pilot. The pilot said, I want you to know how much I appreciate and depend on NOAA. Your weather forecasts are so important to what I do. The fisheries leader said, well, I don't know anything about weather forecasting. I work for the NOAA Fisheries Service. And he walked back down the plane to his seat and he realized he had lost a nice opportunity to take credit for the good work NOAA does and connect and validate an important NOAA constituent. There were a lot of people in that room that could relate to his story and appreciated him telling it. Admiral Lautenbacher talked about a trip he had taken. He was touring a weather forecast office and he asked an employee how they liked working for NOAA. The employee answered, I don't work for NOAA, I work for the National Weather Service. These stories helped us understand that we had a lot of work to do to work better together. So the one NOAA effort was meant to bring the various parts of NOAA together to create, represent, and leverage the broader whole agency. We saw a lot of benefits of one NOAA. By working together, we could deliver better value to our customers by connecting them to a broader array of NOAA services. We could cross market our connections with stakeholders within NOAA and benefit from this broader reach. Some of these connections turned out to be pretty valuable. For example, offshore environmental data is valuable to the Weather Service, but hard to collect. In the North Atlantic, the Weather Service was able to work with the NOAA Fisheries Service to identify fishermen willing to put observing equipment on their vessels. Fishermen care a lot about fish, but they also care a lot about weather because their lives depend on it. The fishermen were willing to collect environmental data because they wanted to improve the forecasts. Partnerships could benefit too from one NOAA. If the National Ocean Service had a special partnership with an aquarium, the aquarium might be interested in learning more about NOAA's ocean exploration program or fisheries program or marine species. So if that NOAA representative was thinking more broadly, they could bring a lot more value um, to the benefit of the organization. If our stakeholders coordinated their support for NOAA, particularly when they were talking to important audiences like Congress, it might result in more money for NOAA. More coherent internal communications might require less work to get the same message out across NOAA. If we all promote NOAA, if we work within NOAA together, we can get more recognition for all of us. Sometimes people joke that we are the best agency no one has ever heard of. That isn't good for our ability to be heard and to achieve the things that we want to achieve. When I look at the NOAA mission statement, I am proud to work for NOAA. I think we have a very important role to play in our rapidly changing world. NOAA's mission is bigger than any line office, but every line office has an important role to play. As our understanding of the interconnectedness of the world expands, connecting the different parts of NOAA together will help us better achieve our mission. We are making progress. We see increased integration as we look across NOAA services. For example, the National Weather Service issues forecasts that save lives and protect property. This is one of the most important services NOAA provides. While the weather forecasts are led by and delivered by the National Weather Service, many parts of NOAA contribute to these forecasts. NESDIS provides critical satellite data. The NOAA Corps flies into hurricanes, conducts snow surveys, and sails around the world collecting data to improve the forecast. NOAA research investigates the ocean and the atmosphere to improve the forecasts. If we tell the full story about weather forecasts, then all the important parts of the story get recognized. I have been the director of education for 15 years, working hard to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. We have been able to do a lot because we have wonderful educators in NOAA and great data and important information to share. When I became the director of education, I got to choose my title. I chose to be the director of education because I wanted to represent the office of education where I work, and all the other parts of education across NOAA as well. We have done a lot of, to build this community and to make it stronger and more effective. 
So what have we done? First of all, we successfully advocated for the importance of education as part of the NOAA mission. And in 2007, Congress passed the America Competes Act, giving every program and every NOAA employee a clear, broad mandate to educate. This came through coordinated effort across NOAA supporting education as part of the NOAA mission. We created the NOAA Education Council to bring together educators from across the agency. The Education Council has a member representing every program in NOAA with a significant investment in education. We have built an education community of practice with a lot of common interests and goals. Together, we created a strategic plan that clearly articulates the importance of our work and how we support the NOAA mission. We work together to support a science-informed society, conservation and stewardship, safety and preparedness, the future workforce, and organizational excellence. The process of writing the plan was inclusive. We wanted to make sure every education in NOAA was well connected to the plan. Every member of the Education Council signed the strategic plan and committed to helping move it forward. We have worked together as a community to, to create resources that provide greater value to our users. We collected student opportunities, internships, scholarships, fellowships, offered across NOAA and created a publicly accessible database that lets people find the opportunities that they are most interested in. You can search by level, you can search by type of opportunity, we put together a similar page for teacher opportunities so that they too could access all that NOAA has to offer in a single place. We put together resource collections focused on the topics teachers are most interested in like hurricanes, marine mammals, and coral reefs. And each of these collections includes the very best resources NOAA has to offer. When the coronavirus hit, we were able to quickly reach out to our community and pull together a collection of education activities that NOAA, that people can do from home. We were, able to, we were able to get the word out about this collection through social media and quickly generated a lot of interest. We collect data from across NOAA from all the education programs NOAA offers and we pull it together. When you add it all up, we do a lot. It helps people understand that NOAA's investment in education has a big impact. In 2019, 61 million people visited informal learning institutions hosting NOAA-supported exhibits and programs. These institutions are some of the best in the country. For example, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, and the Museum of Science in Boston. These institutions are delighted to work with NOAA, and they want their visitors to learn about what we do. Excuse me. This is great for NOAA because more people learn about us and, and more and the important things we do. Our programs for teachers and students also have a big reach. NOAA is building its fut our, our future workforce through our investments in scholarships, internships, and fellowships, and we provide many opportunities for youth and adults to engage with NOAA. We are creating NOAA ambassadors. We also track education efforts across the country and make connections to build continuity and leverage resources. We bring all of these metrics alive through the NOAA Accomplishments Reports, which capture stories about the impact of NOAA education on people's lives. All of these, these things help make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. Through these efforts, we better communicate the value of NOAA education and NOAA more broadly. The Regional Collaboration Network is another one NOAA effort. These are the regional team leads and the regional co coordinators in the Regional Collaboration Network. This network was created to bring together NOAA employees from across the line offices to address regional issues to strengthen NOAA's value and visibility. In order to have regional collaboration, we needed to identify regions. This was not an easy task. NOAA has dozens of regional structures, weather service, fishery service, sanctuaries, ocean observations, and many more programs in NOAA each have their own regional structure based on their programmatic needs, the location of their facilities, and the issues confronting that part of the country. 
After looking at many different configurations, the regions that you see on this map were selected. They are consistent with the large marine ecosystems and the major weather systems. The regional teams bring together NOAA expertise to address regional challenges that span across more than one line office. They also work to share regional and national perspective, perspectives because what makes sense inside the Beltway doesn't always make sense across the rest of the country. And sometimes very important things happen in the regions that need to better inform what goes on in headquarters. The teams also work to connect with regional employees so they can better understand some of the great things NOAA does. The regional collaboration teams have accomplished a lot. Here's an example from the Great Lakes. Since 2010, the Environmental Protection Agency has led the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, a multi-agency effort to protect and restore the Great Lakes. Every year, EPA solicits proposals from federal agencies to find the most strategic way to address the big issues confronting the Great Lakes e e ecosystem. In response, the NOAA Great Lakes Collaboration Team pulls together expertise from across NOAA and submits, submits excellent proposals describing how NOAA can help. These efforts have been rewarded with significant financial support. The Great Lakes team has coordinated over $162 million in grants from EPA. Those funds have allowed NOAA to help reduce the impact of invasive species, protect native habitat, restore native species, and build the foundation for future restoration. Runoff Risk is another project the regional teams are working on. The project started when the Central Region Regional Collaboration Team traveled to the Gulf of Mexico to learn about the issues there. They learned about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and how it was hurting fishing, tourism, and the broader ecosystem. The Gulf dead zone is caused by too many nutrients coming in from the 32 states that drain into the Mississippi River. Many of those watershed states are in NOAA Central Region. Folks on the Central Regional Collaboration Team realized that they might be able to help. They developed a model that uses soil moisture, the forecast for precipitation and temperature, and snow accumulation to predict the likelihood of runoff events. Working with interested states and other partners, they developed a tool that allows farmers to use an interactive map to locate their field and find the forecasted risk of runoff. The farmers don't want their fertilizer to run off. It's expensive to apply and it doesn't do them any good if it doesn't stay where it's needed. So this tool allows for a win-win. It is good for the farmers and it is good for the environment. The runoff risk tool has value for the Gulf of Mexico and also for the Great Lakes and many other watersheds. EPA is helping fund the use of this tool as a way to help meet their water quality goals. This is an excellent example of how NOAA can add value in new ways. Wave runoff is another example of how bringing the NOAA pieces together can add great value. The Superstorm Sandy assessment made clear that a lot of that storm's damage was caused when waves went over the dunes or other coastal boundaries and cause severe inland flooding and erosion. The North Atlantic Regional Collaboration Team decided to tackle this problem. They knew they needed a diverse and talented team. To calculate wave runup, you need to know the height of the wave on top of the tide and on top of the storm surge. You also need to know the shoreline topography. Folks from the Weather Service, the Ocean Service, Sea Grant, and the U.S. Geogetic Survey joined the effort. They successfully built a forecast tool that predicts, predicts the risk of inland flooding due to wave runup. The experimental forecast is currently available on the USGS website. Communities can use this forecast tool to understand their risk of flooding so they can stay, take steps to limit the damage when needed. Here is one more regional collaboration project. We wanted to update the, the, video, the NOAA video so people could quickly find out a little bit about our great agency and the people that work here. We were thinking of calling it Introduction to One NOAA. We talked to Ben Friedman, NOAA's Deputy Undersecretary for Operations, about this effort. Ben asked, do we need to call this one NOAA? 
let's just call it Noah. And so we did. If you are interested in supporting NOAA and finding ways for our agency to deliver more value, I encourage you to do so. There are a lot of ways to help. You can join us in educating the public about NOAA. You can get involved with a regional team. You can give a One NOAA seminar or listen to one. You can be curious about other parts of NOAA, look for ways to connect across NOAA, bring your talents to NOAA challenges, Think about issues and how to solve them, not about programs or line office boundaries. You can reach out and connect with colleagues and get the word about, out about NOAA. The world is changing rapidly and NOAA has a lot of expertise to help navigate those challenges. We can make a bigger impact working together and there is a lot for us to do. Thanks for listening to this presentation. I look forward to any questions. Great, thank you so much, Louisa. This was this was wonderful. We do have a few questions. Uh, first one is, why isn't OMAO on the Education Council? Um, so actually, um, uh, we've talked to OMAO um, several times about being on the Education Council, um, and OMAO has an important education role to play. Um, we love it when they um, are able to allow um, uh, groups and sometimes even open to the public their ships um, when they're docked at uh, shore. Um, uh, they actually help us a lot um, at the Exploratorium. They actually dock their ships at the pier next to the Exploratorium in San Francisco um, and, uh, and bring their scientists, bring the scientists from on board to talk about recent science that's been collected there. Um, so they do a lot. Um, and, and we would be happy to have them on the Education Council, as, as, as in many parts of NOAA. Um, sometimes there just isn't, isn't enough, uh, there aren't enough people to go around. Um, and so we haven't been able to figure out who in OMAO could effectively represent the organization and, um, and, and have the bandwidth to actually connect on NOAA issues. So um, we would be delighted to welcome OMAO to the table um, if they have the capacity to do so. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is, if you can answer this, uh, what type of coverage is NOAA getting for its 50th? Is there a media blitz planned? Uh, so um, uh, obviously a lot of the NOAA 50th campaign that had been planned, um, and thanks to Cheryl Oliver and her team for all the planning that they did, um, was uh, obviated by um, the pandemic. Um, and I know they still have things planned. Um, uh, there's hopes that things will open up a little bit more in the fall and we'll be able to do things. Um, it's hard. It's, it's hard to do a major outreach campaign um, during a pandemic. And, um, and it's a great loss because um, lots of good things uh, had been um, organized. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah. Um, it's, it's a great question and uh, I wish we could be doing more and there still will be some events um, coming. Um, and um, I just wanted to go back. Um, uh, never, never mind. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. Great. Okay, next question. Um, what are specific projects that uh, the Office of Education are most excited about in the coming year? Oh, so we have um, so many great um, education efforts going on. Uh, um, so next week, we actually uh, um, have our virtual orientation for the Hollings Scholarship Program and the Educational Partnership Program undergraduates. Uh, it, it, it was a crazy thing when the pandemic hit. We were actually just about to pick our NOAA scholars and um, we really weren't sure how that was going to happen. We knew we wanted to go ahead and pick our scholars because we wanted to provide um, uh, those amazing students the opportunity to come and work closer at NOAA, but we knew we had over 150 mentors um, planning to, um, to provide in-person experiences for the students, and we didn't know if they would be willing or able to provide those students op opportunities to, um, to work for, the, for them for the summer remotely. And so um, our team did a very good job um, in, in contacting the mentors and 
Um, when we heard that the mentors were willing to work with us, um, we went ahead and selected the scholars, and then um, uh, and, and then we planned the virtual um, orientation for next week. Um, and so that'll be a really exciting thing to have over the summer. Um, I worry a lot about NOAA's interns and fellows um, because it's harder to make the connections um, during a pandemic that you can make in a normal time of year. Um, but um, but I also know that that these kids in these kids come with tremendous digital skills and that they have those to rely on and then they can help us use those skills. So the whole um, the uh, the internships that we have and the scholarships is one huge thing. We also do a lot of work um, in resilience education, um, working with communities that are trying to plan to be more resilient and demonstrating the value of education as a tool in helping communities become more resilient. Um, uh, so it turns out that when you have young people in the room, long-term planning takes on a whole new meaning. When you have young people asking what the world's gonna look like for them, people are more willing to stop and think about um, uh, trying to plan for the community to move forward um, against some of the challenges that may occur um, much more readily. Um, we also have um, amazing citizen science activity. We had a citizen science workshop earlier this year, um, and that was the first time we convened NOAA citizen sciences, scientists across uh, NOAA. Um, we were planning to do that in person, but again, the pandemic made us go virtual, but it went really well, and it was very exciting to see that community gather together. We give out um, watershed education grants um, that are really helping integrate uh, meaningful watershed education experiences into uh, the curriculum, um, formal education across the country. So there are so many things that we're doing that I'm excited about. Thank you, Lisa. That was very comprehensive. We do have a ton of questions rolling in, so I'm going to okay. move on to the next one. Okay. Um, is the Office of Education considering a focused strate strategic approach for the 570 plus federally recognized tribes in the US? I think a partnership with the Department of Interior Bur Bureau of Indian Affairs would be wonderful. Uh, so, um, so it is very important to connect with the native tribes and um, we're very proud. Um, we have had our scholars do things like translate, translate important known material into tribal languages. A comprehensive approach across um, the tribes would be a wonderful thing and I'd love to know more about what other agencies are doing. Um, it is definitely something that, that we're interested in doing more. Um, we feel like we have a lot to give to, the, to those communities and are interested in doing so. Great, thank you. Our next question, how can staff connect with the regional coordinate, coordination teams or learn more about them? Uh, so, um, so we have a website um, uh, that, um, that, that it's the region, NOAA Regional Collaboration uh, Network website and it has the names of the coordinators on, and links to the websites for all the, for the eight regions. Um, and uh, the coordinators are an amazing group of people and they would love to, um, uh, to connect with people that are interested um, in connecting with them in their region. Wonderful, thank you. And we'll uh, put that link in the chat box in one second. Thank you. Okay, our next question. How can we ensure that everyone uses the exact same NOAA logo or to, to not dilute our brand? <laughs> oh, that's a great question too. These are all great questions. Um, so um, uh, the NOAA uh, Office of Communications has the official logos and you can request them. Um, and um, we are trying to um, make those more accessible and more visible to NOAA employees. Um, uh, ben Friedman is working on a NOAA Ambassadors Toolkit um, and hoping that more NOAA employees will um, will promote the agency and become ambassadors. And uh, I think that would actually be a great place to put the NOAA logos. Uh, the NOAA 50th um, uh, website also has the NOAA 50th logo. That's a great place to get a consistent logo. So um, please, please do use more consistent NOAA logos. Wonderful, thank you. Next question. What are your recommendations as to how to find out what types of support different line offices can offer when we want to do large scale outreach? Um, I don't see that question. Could you read it to me again? Yep, no problem. What are your recommendations 
as to how to find out what types of support different line offices can offer when we want to do large scale outreach? Yeah, so um, so a, a, a lot, uh, you know, the weather service does huge outreach on the weather every day. Um, and when a hurricane comes, they have a coordinated approach, you know, so, so much of what um, of the outreach that NOAA does is inherent to our line offices. Um, There's a lot of focused outreach on Shark Week so that people can um, understand um, how few people actually die um, by shark bites um, uh, and, um, and talk about the great things that sharks do. Um, the Ocean Service has tremendous outreach um, uh, capability through its estuarine research reserves and its sanctuaries. Um, and uh, so, um, so, in, so, so the line offices do a tremendous amount, um, and, uh, and and Sea Grant, um, another great outreach part of NOAA. Um, those outreach campaigns are really you really need to go to the line office and look at the individual programs and efforts that they're undertaking. Um, the the NOAA education website, which is a, a one NOAA education website, brings together resources across the board on specific topics, um, but those aren't so much outreach campaigns. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, moving down the line, how do we remedy the various regional structures within NOAA? Remedy? Yes. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think the regional structures within NOAA need to be remedied. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought um, because the regional structures um, for the different parts of NOAA are really innate to the activities that they're conducting. Uh, the the um, the the weather service has its regions built around um, the the major weather systems. The fishery service has its regional um, structures around the large marine ecosystems. And you you don't really you 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 can't change the way the earth functions, and you don't want to change the earth, way the earth functions. Other things like the sanctuaries regions are built around the placement of the sanctuaries and efforts to coordinate at the regional level to better um, then connect with the national level. Um, so I don't, I don't see um, a need to remedy them. I just see a greater need to work across them and to better connect them. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, our next question. How much is the ratio between funding education in STEM disciplines versus the rest of other disciplines? Can you tell in a budgetary ratio such as five to one? Um, so um, the majority of NOAA um, education is STEM related and STEM focused, but we do do a, a lot of things that are not related to STEM. Um, I don't have specific budget numbers for you, but I but I can tell you um, that that the majority is STEM um, and that we do a lot of important things that aren't STEM. So good question. Thank you. Okay, next question is following that same kind of budget marketing uh, direction. What type of marketing budget does NOAA have for outreach? Is that fed down to the offices that are interacting with the community? And how does one get items to use when we speak to the public? Well, that's a great question. Um, so NOAA doesn't have an outreach budget. Um, it's just one of those things that NOAA doesn't have. and um, some programs do spend some of their program funds on outreach and um, and generate um, uh, uh, resources. Uh, sometimes it can be handed out. There are some posters in NOAA, um, but they're pretty limited in their supply. Um, as part of the NOAA Ambassador Toolkit that, um, that we're putting together, we are hoping to have some materials uh, that people can print out on their own, um, but that would be available. Uh, we would love to have um, more things um, and, and we'll try and find funds for those over time, but it, it really is a challenge within NOAA because NOAA doesn't have a budget for outreach materials. Great, thank you. Next question. All the cooperative institutes are required to spend part of their discretionary funds on education and outreach. How is that expansive endeavor integrated into the dissemination of the larger NOAA education program? Uh, so um, uh, the cooperative institutes are so important to what NOAA does, and they provide um, great capability for um, for our scientific endeavors. 
and they have a very important um, uh, re uh, education component. And uh, we connect with that um, in a variety of ways. They they do things like they support the um, the climate um, the climate literacy um, the climate.gov education um, page. They provide they, they provide a lot of uh, screening of resources. That's a very focused and programmatic focus for um, at one of the cooperative institutes. We also have strong partnerships between um, the cooperative institutes and the educational partnership program with minority serving institutes institutes cooperative science centers. And so um, we have uh, faculty that work together. We have students that come from the educational partnership program institutions and go and work with the cooperative institutes. Um, and 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 um, and actually, there are cooperative institutes, institution universities that are part of the cooperative science centers and vice versa. So we actually have these organizations formally proposing um, uh, to work together as part of their um, uh, uh, grant proposals. Um, and, and, and the way the structures are actually working have become integrated. So lots of different connections, lots of important connections and a great resource. Thank you so much. We're moving on to our next question. How does NOAA engage with other federal and state agencies in regards to its education products and initiatives? Oh, very good question. Um, so we do that at many different levels. Uh, I actually re represent the Department of Commerce on the Federal Coordination and STEM um, uh, uh, Subcommittee, um, which is um, it, it pulled together by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And we have um, a, about 20 different agencies that come together in that, under that umbrella, and we do all kinds of things with them. Um, one of the things that I've been um, doing with them is um, is working on actually a virtual internship task force. Um, I sent out an, an email in March saying, have any of you guys done virtual internships and what are you thinking about doing um, uh, for your internships in the summer? And there was such a strong uh, response from across the agencies that we've actually been meeting weekly and now bi-weekly to just figure out basic stuff like, do you give, do you give the students computers? So there's that kind of work. Um, the, the sanctuaries, the National Marine Sanctuaries Program um, works with other resource agencies on um, on promoting resource natural resource education. Um, they also have um, done a lot of work on on the benefits of volunteers um, at sanctuaries, um, and, and that's work that's been interesting um, to other agencies. And um, uh, our citizen science network is well connected with NASA and um, the Park Service and many other agencies. We we learn together about how to. Uh, really engage citizenry in our citizen science. Uh, it, the interagency aspects are very important in so many different directions. Um, uh, so it's a, an important part of what we do. Great, thank you. Our next question, will the ambassador's toolkit also be for external volunteers who want to help spread the NOAA word? Um, so um, right now, um, uh, Makeda Okolo, who's putting that, um, who's leading that effort for Ben Friedman, um, uh, is planning to have the resources go on an intranet site, so they would only be available um, to NOAA employees. But I do think that if there are resources that would be appropriate for a broader audience, we will look to put those on the NOAA Education website so that they can be um, more broadly available because we do have a lot of partners that are interested in helping get the word out about NOAA and we do want to give them materials to work with. So I think that's a great idea. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Uh, next one, looking back at 20 years of One NOAA efforts, do you think the most significant accomplishments were external, i.e. better marketing on Capitol Hill or internal, facilitating cross line office innovation? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, it has been 20 years. Um, so um, I think I think that the um, the primary benefits have been more internal to NOAA, but I also think that there have been um, significant improvements in the way we connect with Capitol Hill. Um, and so um, I think that that all of the councils, the Education Council, the Research Council, the Ocean um, and Coast Council, Observing Council, um, have created a structure that um, help bring the different pieces of NOAA together. Um, I think the Regional Collaboration um, Network has grown stronger, as has the education community. 
um, over these years, in part because of the um, uh, of the efforts early on um, to, to 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 promote these kinds of things. Great, thank you. Our next question. Um, we definitely need to play a place for all of NOAA to coordinate on various activities. For example, when a line office is planning to attend a conference, we may end up finding out later that more line offices are attending. How do we get better coordination on these efforts? Yeah, yeah. Um, I really like going in and seeing NOAA gather together, at least in one corner of a conference, um, uh, rather than seeing the NOAA tables scattered, or, you know, parts of NOAA scattered all over a, 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 a great hall. Um, I think that uh, this is one of the upside benefits of the um, Commerce Department uh, requirements on group travel is that we've actually had to be able to put together group travel requests and therefore we can see who from NOAA is planning to attend, at least NOAA employees who are planning to attend. Um, and I think that it's so lovely when we can actually coordinate that and, um, and, and, and ensure a better representation, broader representation and a bigger representation of, NA of, of NOAA um, when, we, when we go out to those things. It takes work, it takes, people um, taking the lead and being willing to coordinate across the agency and try and make those connections. So I think that's, I think there's a lot more we could be doing there, but, um, but I think we have, we have the basics down um, because of the travel requirements. Awesome. Next question. Funding One NOAA initiatives is very hard because of how funding comes to NOAA. How could we generate a pot of funding that supports One NOAA initiatives? Ah, uh, so I think um, I, I, I thank you for that question. Um, I, I dream about um, uh, uh, answering that question in a different way. Um, you know, I, I, I look at the the Great Lakes, um, uh, and I look at the um, restoration initiative and how they've been able to leverage that. I really do think it's been it's 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 enabled the NOAA team in the Great Lakes to come together. So they regularly look at you know, you were saying, the earlier question was about conferences. They regularly look at, look at um, upcoming meetings um, and outreach events and other opportunities that NOAA can participate in. And they realize that NOAA can't be, um, no one person in NOAA can be at all these events. No line offices can't each attend all these events. And so they've created a pretty deep set of resources that allow them to send a NOAA representative to the meeting, to the outreach event, to the conference, representing all of NOAA. Um, and they even give out a NOAA card, um, which is supported by the regional collaboration team. And so if, um, if you have a weather service person going and somebody starts asking them about, um, a, a, about harmful algal blooms and the weather service representative doesn't really feel comfortable because they don't have the expertise they need to answer that question, then the weather service employee can hand out the, 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 the NOAA card and say, you know, if you email your question to um, this address, then you can get an answer. So um, I, I don't, I don't think that we're going to ever get a pile of money for one NOAA. I think we have to figure out how to make one NOAA from the pile of money that we have. And whether we call it one NOAA or NOAA, we have to figure out how to make sure that we provide the taxpayer the greatest value that we possibly can for their investment in us. Thank you. Our next question, uh, does NOAA try to educate in any other languages than English? Um, well, that's a very good question too, and I and 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 we do do some. Um, we regularly translate materials into Spanish. Um, uh, we have some materials tr translated into native um, languages. Uh, it, it's challenging. Um, resources get updated and changed all the time, and we don't have that much access to um, to, to the tr to the translations. Um, it can be expensive to have things professionally translated, um, but it's a wonderful gift to give to the communities that speak those other languages and, um, and we do it where we can and we, we should be doing more of it. Thank you. Our next question. At this time, is it mandatory for all student opportunities to come through your office? I have a lot of students and teachers who say it is difficult to find an exhaustive list of all opportunities. Well, so I certainly hope you send them to the One NOAA um, Student Opportunity website because um, we may not have all the opportunities in NOAA, but we certainly have a lot of them listed in that database. 
Um, if you if you go to that database and your opportunity isn't listed, please send me an email and let me know. And um, and and all the Office of Education does is gather the opportunities across NOAA and put them in a single place where people can find them. There's no requirement for those opportunities to actually come through uh, NOAA. We just put them together so that they're easier to find. There's opportunities all across NOAA. The, the, the Canals Fellows, um, the National Center for Environmental Prediction have the Lapenta Scholarships, um, and the National Ocean Service has uh, Nancy Foster Scholars. There's, there's um, at, many of the weather forecast offices have internships. So pretty much every part of NOAA offers student opportunities, but we do now have this um, website, um, the student opportunities, NOAA student opportunities website, easy to, easy to Google, easy to find, um, where people can um, can identify what might be best for them. Wonderful. Um, following in this kind of same vein, given the current pandemic and potential to be virtual for a while, does the Office of Education have a specific national virtual strategy to engage with students and teachers in the coming year? Oh, that is a that's a good question. It's something that we think about a lot. Um, you know, we're um, Right now, we have that challenge very squarely in front of us with the um, with the region with the uh, virtual interns that we're going to be hosting, um, and we actually do work across NOAA um, uh, to try and support all the programs that are able to support support virtual interns. So we have that internal conversation going, um, and uh, thanks to the great folks on my staff. Um, we don't know exactly how it's going to work. We've never, for example, at the end of the summer, um, we're going to run um, a, a virtual science um, symposium where the students are going to present their research over the summer. We have no idea how that's going to work, um, but we're going to figure it out and um, we're going to look at what other people are doing and learn from them. Um, how do you do? How do you do regional? I mean, virtual outreach. You know, when you're at a table and people are streaming by, and some people stop and say hello, and you chat chat with them, and they learn about NOAA. We know how that works. How do you do virtual outreach? Um, so, but people are figuring this out. A lot of associations are going to be holding virtual conferences, and we're all going to learn a lot. And my guess is we're going to learn things that we're going to want to keep doing even after the pandemic has subsided. Yes, I agree. Okay, I'm gonna hunt down another uh, question. What is the value of branding for NOAA? Specifically, NOAA has a plethora of logos that may make it difficult for the public to know who we are as a whole agency. What practices are being exercised by the Office of Education to help unify NOAA's brand? Well, so um, so the Office of Education doesn't have its own logo. Um, uh, so you know we use the NOAA logo, um, and you know that's really fundamental. Using the NOAA logo helps people identify um, our office and our agency um, as a whole. Um, we 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 promote the use of the logo. Um, actually, um, my lead for communications put together that logo slide that shows all the um, different versions of the NOAA logo because. Um, uh, you know, she wants to help promote that um, that 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 consistent one NOAA branding um, because it really does make a difference in terms of people's connection with the agency and understanding um, of its importance and its and its strength. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, another question. I'm just going to grab one or two more because we're on we're getting on time there. Uh, how is the Office of Education working with the Weather Enterprise? Ah, well, so the Weather Enterprise is um, an incredibly important part of NOAA. And um, so I think uh, we, we have the higher ed connection. So a lot of our students um, uh, get opportunities in the Weather Service and they go and they have great um, summer internships uh, and learn a lot about NOAA. And sometimes NOAA Weather Service even hires them back. And it's really fun to see our interns become NOAA employees and 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 become competent weather uh, professionals. Uh, we also work very closely with Weather um, Service on a lot of our um, education resources. Teachers really care a lot about weather, and uh, so and we want to make sure that we have really credible resources to offer them. And so our hurricane resources, our tornado resources, our drought resources, so many of our resource collections depend on 
um, expertise from the Weather Service. Uh, so, um, yeah, they're a big part of what we do. Wonderful. Okay, let me find another question. It seems part of the problem is lack of familiarity and, or integration between line offices and the Office of Education. Um, have you considered giving further liaisoning uh, between the line offices and the Office of Education and other units? Um, so um, we have great um, representatives from all the programs across NOAA that um, that have a that have a focus on education, and our education council is really um, it's a community of practice where people come together and learn from each other and share ideas and thoughts and support. Um, the thing that's really cool about the education council is that um, a lot of the educators that are on the education council are the only educator or the only lead educator in their program, and so. When they come to the Education Council, they have the opportunity to talk to other people who are full-time educators. Um, and, and we connect our networks of educators and uh, we offer training for educators. So I feel like in the world of education, we're doing a pretty good job at creating a coherent NOAA capability and correcting, connecting between the Office of Education and the line office's capabilities. But if you have ideas for how we could do better, I'd love to hear them. Please send me an email. Wonderful. Okay, a few minutes left here. Um, there is a question, is there a representative for the staff offices? And I'm guessing that's on the Education Council. Uh, so um, let's see, the Office of Education is clearly a, a, a staff office and it's represented. Um, we also have legislative affairs. Um, most of the other offices don't have a sufficient interest in the matters of education to really want to have an education rep. All of our education council meetings are open to anyone in NOAA. So if you want to check out an education council meeting, um, my calendar is open. They're the third Wednesday of every month. You can get the, uh, in, uh, in the afternoon, you can get the education off my calendar or you can email me and I'm happy to connect you to that information. You can come check out what we do. Um, but most of the staff offices really don't have um, the ability to invest in that level of depth um, in education. Great. Okay, a few minutes left, and we're going to go back to how we can, you know, do this better. So NOAA can't make money selling gear with this logo, but can't we sell it at a cost to promote the NOAA brand? Uh, so that is a fantastic idea, and whoever you are, um, uh, you know, please, please tell me, because we want more people helping us with that effort. We actually, the sanctuaries, um, the National Marine Sanctuaries Program has actually done the work to get the legal documents, to allow people to use their branding, um, to create some gear. And we want to actually try and, um, and get that authority more broadly for NOAA. Um, the Office of Communications in NOAA is very interested in pursuing that. We've actually talked to Commerce General Counsel and they're willing to consider a proposal. We just haven't figured out how to, uh, to get enough expertise um, behind that effort to make it happen. But I would love to see the day where we can actually unleash companies to create um, uh, uh, goods with, uh, and, and sell them with the NOAA logo on them. Thank you so much, Louisa. I am gonna stop the questions there and uh, Thank everyone for coming and joining us today. Our next seminar in the NOAA Environmental Leadership Series will be on Tuesday, June 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern, and it is titled Evolving Challenges in Fishery Science and How We Are Tackling Them by Francisco Werner, NOAA's Director of Scientific Programs and Chief Science Advisor of NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service. And with that, I would love to uh, thank you, Lisa, for giving this wonderful talk today and everyone for your questions. If we didn't get to your question, uh, we will pass these on and answer them offline. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. Thanks all, bye-bye.